All right, Kevin, whenever you're ready. Something happened when I just uh, I just lost the, the Zoom somehow. There it comes back. Okay. Uh, let me do the share screen if that works properly. And it just closed my Google presentation. Hang on a sec, folks. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't. I won't say I volunteered for this. I think drafted is a more accurate verb. And I don't claim to be at all an expert in photography using SLRs or mirrorless cameras. In fact, they're probably not even very good. What what I my claim to fame is that I have made most of the mistakes one can make in doing photography this way, uh, some of them repeatedly. So that gives me some at least strong opinions on what works and what doesn't work well at, at our amateur level. So I'm going to, there's a lot of different ways that you can divide this topic up. A lot of people on the internet divide it differently by targets and other things. I actually approached it a little bit based on the kind of equipment that people are likely to have. Thinking as you begin in this, and a lot of people already have some kind of digital camera at home, may have a tripod. And let's talk about first what you can do with that simple equipment. And then we'll get into a couple of the sort of the more advanced options and what, you know, spending more money and having more complexity in the hardware, what that gets you and also what it doesn't get you. So the first level, again, is what you can do with just the digital SLR. If you don't know what MILC is, that seems to be the new abbreviation for mirrorless interchangeable lens camera, but I just call it mirrorless. That seems to be uh, where most of the manufacturers are heading because it's simpler uh, to manufacture and therefore they can make more profit when they sell it. So start with the body itself. Uh, I don't, uh, I, if, if you already have something, absolutely use what you have. Don't go out and buy anything different. If somebody was starting from scratch, I would not advise going smaller than a micro four third sensor. And I don't think there's any reason to go larger than a full frame sensor. You can, you can get medium format sensors. Cost, uh, pardon the pun, but it kind of goes up astronomically when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no need to have the real high megapixel counts. A lot of cameras are now coming around 45 or 48 megapixels. And in my mind, that really doesn't do you any advantages uh, for astrophotography. And a qualifier here, you don't absolutely have to have an interchangeable lens. What's critical is having full manual control. And there's a handful. There's a Sony I know of. There's a Leica I know of that have a fixed focal length, non-interchangeable lens, but they do have the manual control you need. As a rule of thumb for noise, uh, and this has worked pretty well for me over the years, an ISO 400 image on micro four thirds looks roughly like an 800 image on a um, crop sensor camera and a 1600 ISO image on a full sensor. And so if you translate that, as you'll see later on, I tend to recommend ISO 1600 as a good starting point for astrophotography. If you translate that and you want that level of noise <laughs> with a micro four, four third sensor, then basically you're shooting at ISO 6400 which is not ideal. You do get a, a lot of noise at that level. But I'm going to say, repeat what I said up front. You use what you have to start with before you invest in anything new. And as anybody who's used a telescope knows, particularly refractors and SCTs, there are real pain in the neck without a, a star diagonal there. Craning your neck to look at something up in the sky is, is difficult. So a body that has a tilting or a fully articulated LCD on the rear screen is really handy because then you can flip that out at a convenient angle 
so you're not having to look up at 45 or 60 degrees. Any lens from a, a moderate wide angle to a short telephoto, I think works well as a starting point. There's some qualifiers that we'll get into later, but generally a fast aperture is better than slow. And primes, at least for astro, are generally better than zooms. Now there's, there's some good exceptions to that rule, but when you're starting out, don't buy a $1,500 zoom lens if astro is your, your primary need until you're sure you need that. Start, start with a $200 50 millimeter lens and see how it goes. Sturdy tripod is kind of obvious. That does not the same thing as expensive, and it's not necessarily the same thing as a lightweight carbon fiber tripod unless you're doing airline travel or hiking with it. What I use is a, is a probably two decades old studio tripod that weighs a ton. Well, for what we're doing, weighing a ton, if, you, if you're photographing from a car, weighing a ton is not a bad thing. Uh, typically, we will wind up using the built-in self timer, but for anything beyond the starting point, having a remote re release or a remote intervalometer makes life a lot simpler. What can you do with just that basic level of equipment? Well, you can do solar system phenomenon. You can do the bright solar system targets like the sun, the moon, the bright planets. And probably with interest, I would guess most of our audience here is the deep sky subjects, the, the, the broad views of the Milky Way, what I call constellation portraits, where you're taking a shot of a Riga or Orion, and it's fun to see what Messier Yacht <coughs> pull out of a, of a 35 millimeter sensor frame. And then what are commonly called nightscapes, which puts a foreground object in the, in the frame. And those get a little more complicated, as we'll see. Any, and by the way, any questions at, at any point, people just jump in and interrupt. So techniques, um, first rule, take, take it off of auto. <laughs> the, the, auto the auto modes are, are, are going to try to outwit you and they're almost guaranteed to fail. You really want to be able to have full manual control over the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. You will play with those, but you want to be in control as you vary those settings. You don't want the camera to be trying to outwit what you're doing. There are some exceptions where autofocus will work. Obviously, if you're doing solar or lunar photography, some cameras will autofocus on a, a, a bright planet like Jupiter or a bright star like Sirius, but generally they struggle. So I would recommend using manual focus. And once you get that manual focus uh, as sharp as you can get it, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second, tape down the focus ring so it doesn't move as you're, as you're going through the evening and possibly repositioning the camera. Um, a lot of autofocus lenses today, for, especially for digital SLRs and mirrorless cameras, there's two places you have to set manual focus. One is on the body itself and another is on the lens. So make sure you put both in the manual focus mode. To get focus, what you're going to do is put it in what's typically called live view. You're not looking through the eyepiece. You're, you're displaying the image from the sensor on the rear LCD screen. And then and you use the magnify button to magnify that as much as you can. And uh, again, pick a bright star. Sometimes I'll use Jupiter and I won't be trying to focus on Jupiter. I'll see if I can get the, the, the bright moons to be as pinpoint as possible. Once you get that, then, then take the focus ring down so you don't have to worry about it for the imaging run. Start with the, the lens aperture wide open. Uh, we'll get to refinement on that later. Start at ISO 1600. You may well find that when you start taking some trial images, that's not enough and you're going to have to bump it higher, but that's a good starting point. And there's a very common rule that's been around since the days of film photography called the 500 rule which basically says divide 500 by the focal length of your lens. And that tells you how long an exposure you can take without having visible star trailing. Now, when we say the focal length of your lens, we're typically talking in terms of the full frame equivalent. 
So for example, if I have, if I shoot on a full frame camera, a 20 millimeter lens, and I use the 500 rule, that would suggest I can take a pretty long exposure. And I'll show you later that doesn't always pan out that way. However, if you have a sensor smaller than full frame, there's what's called a crop factor. So on a, 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 a what's called an APS or a crop sensor digital SLR, that 200 millimeter lens or excuse me, 20 millimeter lens is equivalent to a 30 on full frame terms. If I put that same 20 millimeter lens on a micro four thirds camera, it's equivalent to a 40 millimeter full frame lens. So when you do this sort of what I use a 200 rule, but whatever rule you settle on, remember that if you're dealing with a camera smaller than full frame, you got to add that crop factor in when you're sort of calculating the, the equivalent lens focal length for that sort of shutter speed determination. Again, these are going to be real obvious things. Use the self timer delay to eliminate vibration from pressing the shutter. Better still if you have a remote release so you don't even have to touch the camera to activate it. Long exposure noise reduction. That was a bugaboo for years and years when digital cameras first came out. Uh, a lot of, a lot of Early attempts at digital were fairly noisy at high ISOs. The camera manufacturers realized that, so they built in software uh, that was designed to, sometimes they took an explicit dark frame, a lot of times they did not, but basically it tried to remove noise and, and, and retain true signal. Well, in those days, the cameras had a hard time telling a hot pixel from a red star or a blue star. And they, both the, the, the Nikon system, the Canon system, and the Sony system, among their user groups, all those long exposure noise reduction things were called star eaters, because it seems like they'd pull out a third of your stars in an image. They have gotten a lot better. And particularly in the, in the temperatures that we tend to photograph in, I would try them. If you have a relatively recent camera, I, I think they may be the way to go. That was not the advice people would have given as recently as five years ago. Uh, when you're on manual, the, the beauty of digital is you get the instant feedback. You're not having to wait a week to get the slides back from the processor. So take, take your test Exposure. Make sure the exposure falls where you want, to, want it to fall. And similar to what we do with sort of conventional astrophotography, 25% from the left margin of the histogram is, is a good starting point. But the beauty of digital is if you miss something there, if it didn't compose properly, if you overexposed it, um, if you tried the 500 rule and found you don't like how much start trailing you got, it's so easy and it's zero cost to just tweak that, tweak one or two of the settings and, and try it again until you get it where you're comfortable and where you're comfortable with the results. I'm going to show you a couple quick examples. They're nothing fancy. Uh, some of them go back quite a few years here. Um, but typically they're all single exposures with the camera on a tripod using the self timer, using manual focus. And I usually close down the f-stop at least one, if not two. Transit from, man, time flies, 20, 10 years ago already. Uh, with, with a Canon crop sensor camera, the beauty of the sun and the moon is you can take very, relatively fast shutter speeds. So trailing doesn't really become an issue. And you can bump to pretty low ISO, so you don't see much noise in, in the images. Uh, here's another one of the eclipse from a couple years ago. Here's one of the quarter moon, but shoot, this must have been six or seven years ago. And again, and I'm, I'm able to shoot at ISO 200. The, the lens is stopped down probably one and a half stops from maximum aperture at that point. This stuff is easy because they're so bright. The only thing that a lot of people starting in this level of photography won't necessarily 
we have at the long lens. This was probably taken with the 200 to 500 at the 500 millimeter setting. A lot of amateurs, unless they have a need for that kind of lens, don't invest in it. You can take it with shorter focal length lenses, but as we all know, there's a point when you can sort of over enlarge an image and you start to lose too much detail. Uh, this is this was one taken with the 200 to 500 at the 500 setting. This was, oh, excuse me, that shouldn't say f4.0 because I wish my lens were that fast. That would have been f6.3, but I could still take it at a moderate ISO. It's it's easy to frame. It's easy to focus. Bright bright targets are not your problem here. <laughs> This starts to be probably the kind of astrophotography most people are interested in, which is capturing the stuff up in the deep sky, the Milky Way, the Messier objects, um, sometimes with a foreground object, sometimes with not. This was some just experiments I was doing on a trip up to the North Rim, and it was at the very tail end of the season when essentially everything, including the lodge, was shut down. The only thing that was open was the campground and the restrooms. Surprisingly, at just a 10 second exposure, all the red light here is coming from the red exit signs, which were still illuminated inside the main lodge. But this one's interesting for a different reason and is why I'm showing you. In this corner of the vertical image, that's the Pleiades down there. And up here is M31. I mean, in a, a single 10 second exposure with a fair, you know, fairly conventional, not state of the art camera, ISOs bumped up a little bit, a stop from that starting point. It's easy to capture that. That's I'm not saying these are showpiece things, they're not hanging over the sofa, but it shows you without a whole lot of effort with what the cameras are capable of capturing. This is probably a little closer to what people imagine. You're having a nice view of the Milky Way, you're comfortable with the colors. It's got an obvious flaw in the foreground. This is this is what I get for not paying for a proper male model in the foreground. I, I had to make do with whoever wandered in into CAC from out in the desert. So that, that's that's tough. Here is where I was using. Yeah, resemble that. Yeah, you do resemble that. <laughs> hey, you 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 take your chances with who you set up to next on the public pads here. Anything can happen. I, I, here's where I, I started with the 500 rule. I knew I wasn't real happy with that till I was a little more conservative and a 20 millimeter lens for 20 seconds sort of equates to a 400 rule. Here's why I don't like the 500 rule. I don't even like the 400 rule. Notice the visible trailing on every star. It's a short dash. It's not a pinpoint. Now, you would have to go to, to awfully short exposures to get pinpoints. There's a level where people are more comfortable with. As I said earlier, personally, I would advise a, a 200 rule. Uh, I've not been happy with anything at sort of the 500 rule level. This is, a, this is a nice image if you were looking at it on a phone, if you were looking at it on a small tablet, but if you thought you wanted to enlarge that at home and print it, you're probably not going to be happy with how the, the star images in the corners or even in the center. Remember, when it's trailing, everything is trailing here. This hey, Kevin, that shows up beautiful on a calendar, buddy. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> um, this little crop is sort of just left to center. But I could, I could have taken the crop up in the corner. I could have taken it dead center. All the stars will show as trailed there. So again, my, one of my bits of advice is don't buy the 500 rule. I think that's now obsolete. This was one taken with the 200 rule and a fisheye lens down at CAC. This is a small sensor camera. This is micro four thirds. And yet, and here's a case where I unfortunately needed to bump it up to ISO 6400. That starts to get to be pretty noisy, pretty grainy if you enlarge it a whole lot bigger than what, what I'm showing to you here. But it's a decently pleasing image. This is one where I'm, I'm probably getting a little better with the post-processing. Full frame camera, the same 20 millimeter lens, stop down one stop. 
ISO, I raised it one stop to compensate for stopping the lens down. So I started, I would have used ISO 1600 with the lens wide open, closed the lens down a stop, bumped up the ISO, used 13 seconds just to get a little more light in the sky. I did some 10 second ones, which were the 200 rule, and I was just trying to push the limits a little bit. And this, this is Jim, and that's just about a second or two illumination from a headway up to add color to the foreground object. I have never sort of gotten real excited about star trails, so I've never done very, very many of them. The couple times I've tried, what became very obvious is unless you're in super dark skies, you take an image in, in a lot of our skies much over five or 10 minutes, which isn't enough to show a very long star trail, and the image is overwhelmed with sky fog. All that background light from urban lighting, from dust and haze in the atmosphere, reflecting those urban lights, you lose the signal of the stars. I know Olympus, and why I'm showing you this, this image, Olympus has a little crafty way of getting around that, which they call live composite. And you take an initial exposure, it records the light levels at every pixel, if you will. So the, you, you properly expose for your foreground, for the silhouette of the trees, for the sky background. And then it takes a whole string of identical exposures right afterward. But the only thing it writes to the, that saves to the, the card storing the image is any increases in light level. So if the rotation of the earth causes that one, that one star, which formerly had been on a pixel here, rotation is now sort of lit up a different pixel, it will record that as new light. It won't keep adding light to the foreground or the sky background, so it doesn't wash out the base image, if you will. And as, as this guy demonstrates, you can get my nice star trail there, and you know, he was doing this just pre-dawn, so there's a fair amount of light in the sky. But you can imagine if you try taking a 45 minute exposure in a pre-dawn sky, it's gonna be pure white. I would guess some of the other mirrorless manufacturers are trying to adopt similar things to what Olympus is doing here. I don't know when their patent on this live composite thing runs out, but star trails are possible in the, with the right sky. We've all, all known, if we followed any kind of astrophotography for the past decade or two, the advantage of stacking images. You can, you can reduce the noise, sort of improve your signal to noise ratio. And there's been free software programs out there. Most of the, the dedicated astro processing pr programs also have some stacking features built into it. So again, picture we've got the DSLR camera, a 50 millimeter lens, we're pointing it somewhere near overhead and we wanna get Cygnus, a portrait of the constellation Cygnus. So you don't have any foreground objects in that image. You don't have the horizon in that image. You just got stars. You can take a series of short images up to the limit of where you can tolerate the trailing and say that's a 10 second image, like the one I showed of Jim down at CAC. Take a half hour or an hour's worth of those 10 second images and stack them in either free software or a dedicated processing program. That's been kind of a no brainer in astrophotography world for at least a decade. Now the next improvement people made when they wanted to have a foreground image, but they needed a long, longer exposure or more stacked short exposures is, well, how do we deal with that foreground? I mean, the, the stacking software kind of simplistically assumed in the old days, everything moved. And so we can take this pinpoint of the three stars in Orion's belt and we stack them in successive images so they all align. Well, if you have a tree in the foreground, that's gonna have the effect of blurring that foreground image. The traditional method of doing that was to take a single image of the foreground, expose it the way you want. If Maybe you don't want that tree to be a pure silhouette. Maybe you want a little bit of, of late dusk lighting on it. 
uh, and then used Photoshop to layer that foreground image on top of the stacked image of the stars. I've seen, and you've probably seen some wonderful results using that kind of technique. It's a little bit of a headache to do, but it, 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 it is very good for quality. In the past couple of years, there's come out an, an easier system in, in two software packages. For Macintosh, it's called Starry Landscape Stacker. For Windows, it's called Sequator, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And basically, you take your stack of everything, the stars in the foreground image, and before you start processing, you delineate with your cursor, what's the foreground image that is not to move? And it will extract that foreground image from one, one image in your stack. So it will stack all the stars and it will superimpose that single foreground frame over, over the image. And I, it is, that's kind of a wordy way of doing it. It's easier to show you with examples. This is one from the Grand Canyon this summer. Again, small sensor camera, fish, or the, yeah, that was the fisheye for that one. 16 frames stacked in sequator. All I had to do was use the cursor in that software to delineate the rim of the canyon here. Came out with a decent result. Um, again, because it's small sensor, because it was a bit noisy, it's high ISO, I'm not sure that would hang over the sofa. But for sharing purposes, it's a fairly pleasant result. This one was fun to do, but it takes a little explanation. This is a, this is a full frame fisheye. So it's 180 degrees from corner to corner. Mm. The left edge is Colorado River upstream to the east. The right edge is Colorado River downstream to the west. This rim is the north rim behind my head, and this rim is the south rim at my feet. Now, this one, what happened is we started to get some clouds along the edge of both rims, so that, that here you get a nice crisp edge to the can, edge of the canyon. Here it starts to get soft, and that's because there's clouds in some of the frames, which I think confuse the, the stacking software. Again, I don't claim these are great examples, but what they do show is with a single camera and lens and a tripod and short exposures, you're not restricted to just single frames like that. You can actually start stacking multiple short frames and get a result like that. That would be far better with a full frame, but I wasn't lugging a full frame and a heavy tripod down to the river. So let's move on to where do you go beyond that? Well, the obvious next step is you deal with that problem of the stars trailing over anything beyond a very short exposure. Everybody's heard of these star trackers. There's any given time, there's at least a couple good ones on the market. I think they probably start around 300 and probably go up, you know, closer to a thousand. I've had several. I'm down to one. I, mean, I realized about a year or two ago that I had three and I really shouldn't have three, but some of those were a learning experience and I wound up with an ioptron as my current one. That functions like a single axis telescope mount. It tracks in right ascension. That solves most of your trailing problems. In fact, if you get accurate enough polar alignment, it solves all your trailing problems. The newer ones seem to have built in rechargeable batteries. The older ones either had replaceable double A's or they had a separate power source. And so that's why I made the comment beyond the tracker, you need, it, you need the power source if it's not built in. Here, I would argue, because you're tracking, let's say you're taking an hour for that Cygnus portrait instead of one single 10 second exposure, you don't want anything to move. You, you probably need a heavier, sturdier tripod. You don't want the camera to move on the, there's a separate, typically a ball head that mounts the camera to the tracker. I'll show you a picture of one of these rigs later on. But just like in regular astrophotography, you have to lock everything down fairly tightly and it starts with having a stable base, which is the tripod. I'll show you in a second what I mean by L-plate, if you don't know what that is. Like a conventional telescope mount, 
Star trackers need accurate polar alignment. So you not only have to spend some time on that at the front end, but you need some optical or electronic assistance to get that accurate. That's typically not something we, any of us can eyeball very well. Some cameras have a built-in intervalometer where you can say, I want to take a series of 60 one-minute exposures of Cygnus. Most still don't have that, and so I've become a fan of having a remote one. It seems to be a little easier to program, and it, it saves you sort of getting near the camera during the exposure sequence. L-plate, a little detour on L-plates. In the telescope world, we have two standard dovetail mounts for mounting the scope to the, the, the tripod and the head. And it's either the skinnier Vixen dovetail or it's the wider Lasmundi dovetail. Photography world, there's, there's a different one. It's sort of similar width to the Vixen dovetail, but it's much shallower. It's maybe only about an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch high. There is a single standard called Arca Swiss, which is used for both the plates that go on the bottom of a camera or a long lens, and then the clamp that goes on the top of a tripod head. I'll show you this to explain why I think that's important, and it's not a very expensive refinement. This is, on the left photo here is what an L plate looks like. It's a single piece of machined aluminum that secures to the base and wraps up the left side of the camera. It's usually, you can't see it here, but it's cut out. Well, you can see a little bit on this one. This is cut out so you can access the ports typically found on the left side of the camera. If you did not have an L plate and you wanted to take a photo in vertical orientation, this is how you have to do it. The, the, the head of your, your ball head drops down into one of these little slots to enable you to position the camera vertically. But look how unbalanced that load is. Everything's hanging off one side. I mean, I just did this on a small tabletop tripod, but the same principle would, would apply, especially if you're sitting on top of a star tracker. The L plate lets you use the short vertical leg of the L, and you can center the weight of the camera and the lens directly over the ball head. So it's one of those that sort of makes the whole rig a little more stable for not a whole lot more money. What does tracking get us? Yeah, it'll obviously allow us for longer exposures, which means you can start getting into the brighter deep sky objects and you no longer are restricted to a really wide angle lens. You can start taking short to medium telephotos of something like the North American Nebula or the Orion Nebula. On the faint extended objects, like say a broad view of the Milky Way, you can take a much longer exposure. You're no longer restricted to something like 10 seconds. You can start taking a minute or two. And if you're into the sort of phenomena part of astrophotography, a longer open shutter time means you have a better chance of catching meteors, but you also catch more aircraft and satellites in the process. So it's sort of a mixed blessing. I'm not going to really talk about this in detail, but the whole development and maybe the past decade of lucky imaging, where you take a video sequence of, say, Jupiter, and you're capturing at 100 frames a second for 10 seconds. That gives you 10,000 video frames. Software can sort out which are the sharpest of those frames and, and, and stack just the sharpest from that sequence and sort of ignore the ones where the atmospheric motions kind of blurred it out. Almost all modern cameras now that are good for, for single frame photography are also very good little video cameras. So with the right long lens and with tracking, all of a sudden you could do some very good results on say the lunar surface. Instead of taking a series of short conventional single exposures, take 10 seconds of video. We use software. Greg, I'm blanking on the name of the software we use for planets now. Um, Fire uh, capture. Yes. Um, you know, you use something like that to extract the 100 sharpest frames out of that sequence, 10,000 video frames, and you, and you can do some decent sort of solar system imaging with that. 
techniques. Um, if you were shooting with a fisheye, if you were shooting with a very wide angle end, something in say the 14 to 20 millimeter range, you might be able to get by with eyeballing your polar alignment, and that might be good enough to allow you to have um, exposures of 30 seconds or a minute. But boy, once you get to longer exposures, once you get to longer focal lengths, you really need precise polar alignment. The, the second sentence in that first bullet is something Doug taught me, which is when you balance your, your setup, Balance it pointed at the target you intend to photograph. Don't don't sort of what, what and what I used to do was you you, you start with the scope on, you know pointing at the at, at the north celestial pole, get your polar alignment, you balance it in that position, and then if by chance you're shooting something toward the southern horizon, which typically we do, that balance is no longer quite accurate. In some ways, it probably becomes a little more critical with star trackers because you've got some moving parts perched on top of each other. You have your tripod. There's a latitude adjustment base, which has some mechanical screw adjustments like our telescope mounts do. On top of that is the tracker itself, which has a single axis drive. On top of that, you have a ball head. And then on top of that, you have a camera and a lens. And so you got to be, it's not just a matter of the, the objective accuracy of your polar alignment, but if you polar align and then have to move the camera to say photograph the Orion O Nebula, odds are really high you, you, you've bumped your polar alignment just a little bit in that process. So my advice is do your polar alignment in the shooting position. 500 rule no longer matters here. We, the whole reason we got the star tracker is to eliminate that star trailing. But what you need to do is take e, each com, combination of lenses that you might want to use on the tracker and run some experiments and say, okay, for my, my wide angle 20 millimeter lens, I can do a four minute exposure and 80% of the stars are still round. So that's a good enough keeper rate. If I want to use a 50 millimeter lens, which is a little bit longer, maybe I can only do two minutes worth before I have to start throwing out too many frames. And if I want to use a 200 millimeter telephoto, maybe I'm only able to do one minute exposures. That's that sort of common result. Don't expect that you can always do a 10 minute exposure with a long telephoto because these trackers are just not built that sturdy. The gearing is not as finely machined as you would expect on a good tele telescope mount. So the second bullet is to figure out what, what's the longest tracked exposure you can take, take some experimentation. Continue using manual exposure. Here's a case where I think ISO 1600 is still a good starting point, but you have the flexibility because you can take longer exposures now and the tracker's keeping up with the stars. You can actually dial that down a little bit. You can come, drop down to ISO 800 or 400. That typically gives you better star colors. That typically gives you a touch more dynamic range in the image. Uh, manual focus again, just like we've, we've done before. And again, I, I'm, I never used to trust long exposure noise reduction. I'm starting to. And we'll talk a little bit about why it's an advantage over the conventional way of, of doing noise reduction. This last point is sort of the most painful. This, the, the need to stop down. You can have some very expensive lenses, and I have yet to see one that I consider give sharp stars at the corners. I've, I've seen $1,500 lenses that don't give sharp stars at the corners. So, again, because the tracker gives you some luxury of a longer exposure while your stars still stay round, you might have thought, well, I, I paid good money for this F2 lens. Damn it, I'm going to shoot it at F2 in a two-minute two exposure. Stop it down one stop and shoot it at a four-minute exposure, and you, your stars in the corners will be much sharper as a result. Here's an example of uh, 
part of my learning process, the trial and error process. This was with a Rokinon 14 millimeter lens, 2.8 wide open. Almost every site past half dozen years identified this as the best bargain lens for Milky Way photography. Sharp to the corners is the phrase. 15 second exposure, already closed down one stop and yet look at what the stars are like in the corner. This is not this is not motion of you know the, the the stars trailing. You don't see that in the center of the frame. You only see that on the corners of the frame. Um, I sent that one back. Got. I read some reviews that suggested the 16 millimeter was a little better, so I returned the 14, and this is what I got from the 16 in the corners. <laughs> Uh, third one I got was acceptable and it died a year later due to other circumstances. So I'll tell you a little more later, but basically as a rule of thumb, money doesn't necessarily buy you the best optical quality if you're fussy about how things look in the corners. This is a single act exposure uh, back when we, seven years ago now, we had a decent comment by the Pleiades. Two points about this one. One, this is when I started to believe a little bit in long exposure noise reduction. And in, in the case of Nikon, as soon as you finished your light frame, it immediately takes a dark frame of the same exposure and then subtracts that. And it seems to, at least in current generation, have gotten pretty good about not tossing out the stars in the process. The other point about this one, this is taken with a $200 or 50 millimeter lens. Yeah, I had to stop it down two stops, but I mean, it's not a bad result for a fairly inexpensive proposition here. This one is, is stacking multiple exposures. This was 23 light frames, seven darks. They were a real pain. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, this was with a, uh, a Canon and mounting a legacy short telephoto from Nikon. And again, had to stop down one and a half stops from wide open, but it holds up decently. So where do we go from that basic level of, of camera fixed on a tripod to camera fixed on a tripod, but stacking a series of short exposures to camera on a tripod with a star tracker. Can you improve things at all? This is my personal path here of, of what I thought was reasonable improvement for the investment. Red dot finder is cheap and trying to frame your photo through, it's basically it's impossible through the camera eyepieces. It, a little bit possible with the mirrorless cameras because basically what you're seeing through the eyepiece is the view of a very small TV screen, if you will. The optical viewfinders through uh, DSLRs are not real helpful. But if you don't have a bright target, say you're not shooting the Orion Nebula, but you're trying to shoot M33, a lot of us could find M33 by star hopping to it, but you probably are not going to see it on the camera rear LCD, even for uh, you know, boosting that to a high S ISO. Red Dock makes it easy. You, you, can, you can find your target in five seconds. Counterweights, cameras and lenses have gotten kind of heavy. Uh, even the mirrorless ones are sometimes built like tanks and they're a little bit heavy. And so I think a counterweight system, which is, because it's not electronic, it's just basically you know steel and iron is a pretty cheap enhancement to this that gives you better balance. The appeal of this kind of photography is you don't need a whole lot of gear. In fact, you don't have to have a computer with you. You can set the camera to record your 20 frames and bring it home and process it at home. And so you can travel light, and especially if you're doing air travel, that's very appealing. Personally, I found having computer control with software helps not just with polar alignment, focus and framing, but the, the programs that manage your image capture, they make it a lot, a lot less painful than sort of having the camera up there doing its own thing. 
And the last thing, which is another non-electronic but surprisingly expensive enhancement is a precision altazimuth base. You, you're probably familiar with the real small thumb screws with very fine pitch thread on the base of our mounts, our equatorial heads. That's what you adjust to get your, your RA axis pointed precisely at the celestial pole. You Usually what's built into a three or a $400 star tracker is not very precise. And so once you get out of the realm of wide angle lenses, buying a separate altazimuth base that gives you that precision for polar alignment is very, very useful. This is, I actually overshot a little bit. This is backing up to the, the maximum that I would bother using out, out in the field. And that's a, a full frame camera that I've had for a number of years. It's not the current model. The lens is heck, 10 or 15 years old. Uh, the Sky Guide, the Sky Guider Pro is maybe only about four, four years old. And the version I got has the electronic polar alignment feature. It sort of has a very small camera in there. It does a quick plate solve and guide you on a computer screen as to how to tweak tweak the base to get as close to perfect alignment as you can get. Main reason I do that is that I can no longer tilt my neck enough to look through an optical finder that's elevated 34 degrees above the horizon. This has the uh, counterweight system, which is I don't know, 60 bucks if that. It's got that, that precision altazimuth base I just showed you a picture of. Separate ball head to mount the camera on top of the tracker. The big old studio tripod, a little red dot finder sitting in the hot shoe, and a cable leading to the laptop. And Doug seen me do this when I have the main telescope and CC, you know, CMOS camera running, and I get bored. I set up this and run this in parallel, uh, you know, in another corner of the pad, and image something else at a different focal length or a different target. Hey, Kevin, can I jump in here for a second? Yep, absolutely. Go back to your picture there for a second. I want to point something out to everybody. Yes. Um, everybody, I'm a retired professional photographer, and I know a lot about tripods. And one thing I want to emphasize is you cannot underestimate the importance of having a sturdy tripod. Absolutely. It is, it is the weakest link in your system if you have a weak tripod. I've seen people throw money at cameras and lenses trying to fix their photo problems when it was merely they had a bad tripod. Um, so getting a good sturdy tripod, and especially most tripods have that little extension. It's a one tube that go up. Don't use it. If you, on my Gitzo tripod, I was able to throw that away. It's not even in my tripod anymore. My ball head mounts directly to the head of my tripod. Once you send that little shaft straight up, you now have a monopod. Those three <laughs> legs aren't doing a damn thing for you. Yep. So I, um, uh, Kevin here has a Manfrotto tripod. Highly recommend Manfrotto as well as Gitzo. Those are the, by, do, do not buy tripods from Best Buy. <laughs> Correct. And in, in, in fact, the, the, the last one I bought for an upcoming trip is a Leo Photo and it's got precisely the detachable center column because I really didn't want it. I, I recognize that's a weak link. There's the big push is to buy carbon fiber. And yes, it's, it's very light for its strength. It's very, um, it resists vibration pretty well, but it's ultimately still light. And if you were say photographing in windy conditions, if you're like me and you kick your tripod leg several times a night, I actually prefer something that's heavier. If I had the money and we're doing this as my primary source of nighttime photography, I'd probably be buying one of those Berlebach wooden tripods. And yeah, right. that, may weigh, and, that may weigh 20 pounds. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. And the other thing you can do, a lot of tripods in that center column, they might have a hook at the bottom that comes down. Mm -hmm. From that hook, you can hang like a sandbag or even your backpack or something. You hang a weight off of that and that pulls everything down and helps keep your tripod steady because even the vibration of you walking around on the ground or on a tripod will cause vibration up through that. And that's why heaviness helps. 
Anyway, Absolutely. Get my piece of dry pot, Kevin. And, and one note on, on your comment there, I learned the hard way that when you hang a weight bag off the bottom of that hook, you don't want it swinging free because the wind will start some vibration. It's best to have it just touching the ground so the bulk of the weight yeah. is still pulling the tripod down, but that contact point keeps the bag from swinging around. Yeah. Um, I'm almost done here, and we we're probably almost done on time. So these first four bullets, I think, are for a modest cost. They're worthwhile refinements if you start doing Star Tracker kind of photography. And then I do a dotted red line here. There's a couple more things I want to talk about. I would personally caution you to think hard before you go there. Um, this is where that voice in your head should be saying, danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> These are of, well, let me, let me talk about them individually and I'll tell you my, you know, my take on them collectively. Guiding, you know, it takes a separate guide camera. It takes a separate little guide scope. It can be very small. It can be one of those little 30 millimeter ones. But the weak link in this one is it's only guiding in one axis. It's not guiding on your deck axis. The lack of red sensitivity is a big problem with conventional cameras. The sensors themselves are pretty broad spectrum sensitive, but the problem is camera manufacturers put a filter in front of the sensor to filter out both extreme ends of the spectrum, the UV end and the deep red end. And as a consequence, we tend to lose the stuff that sometimes we care about the most. And I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Left is an unmodified DSLR, two minute exposure, of Cygnus, and you can barely top center make out a little bit of the red signal from North American. Not a whole lot. And in fact, I had to boost saturation to bring that out. Well, when you boost saturation for the whole image, you make every star a little bit out of whack as a consequence. This is the same exposure, same lens with a, a modified Canon SLR, where you send it to an independent service, they pull out that filter and replace it with clear glass. And you can tell, just a quick glance, you're getting more distinct hydrogen alpha at the nebula. You're getting it back here through the heart of signals. This is the same setup as this, but it's a, it's a stack of multiple exposures. And that's probably what a lot of us aspire to if you were trying to show someone a, a portrait of what the Milky Way passing through Cygnus looks like. Camera manufacturers in the recent years, at least Nikon and Canon, have both issued a specific model for astrophotography designated by a little A at the end. So in the case of Nikon, it was like a D810 sub A. And it had both the filter removed and a couple other things. A lot of people will take a, an existing camera that they're no longer using, they'll buy something used on the market and have it modified. And I did that. And I didn't think it was, it was a bad way to go. It certainly got me more red signal. But the one thing it didn't solve was this last bullet, the cooling. If I were shooting in Minnesota or Alaska, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend getting a modified DSLR or mirrorless for this purpose. But our problem is real. the very times you want to image the Milky Way is the warmest time of the year. You start out warm, the camera sensor is running more or less continuously, so it's warming up through the evening. And if you try to do dark frames later in the night, we're dealing with the rapidly dropping desert temperatures. And I struggled for so long trying to build good dark libraries. And at least in the case of Nikon, they don't record to the EXIF file what the sensor temperature is. So you really, software will scale it, but it needs to know sort of what temperature each dark frame is taken at. That's kind of why I've come back to thinking the long exposure noise reduction approach where you take your light frame and immediately thereafter at essentially the same temperature, you take a, a dark frame and subtract it. And then you do another pair and then you do a, another pair. And that seems to be in my mind, a more efficient way to get this done. The other reason I sort of put this red line here and said, I'll talk about these three together together 
if you were, I've sort of accumulated those bits and pieces over the years and a number of them were used. If you went out to buy that new, I think you could probably get all of it new. That's about $3,000 worth. That's before you do any of these things. If you get anywhere approaching that, I would seriously advise you're better off with a short refractor, with a cooled camera, which is really nice to have in the summer in Arizona, and with a conventional um, EQ mount that can track in both axes. For the similar investment, you get more versatility and better results, I think. A couple parting thoughts on lenses, and then I'll wrap it up here. The good news on lenses is you don't need autofocus. You don't need electronic aperture control. And that opens up a, a, a huge set of what they call legacy lenses, the manual focus, manual aperture lenses from 70s on. And, and there's a big market in those. I've gone through a lot of them. Some were better than others. Uh, as people as people constantly chase the latest technology, there's people who are dumping very recent systems because they want to either change manufacturers or they want to go from a DSLR to a mirrorless camera and they, that requires a change in your lens mount. So there's some pretty good deals to be had on, on the used market. You don't need a huge assortment of lenses. I think pick one wide angle that's your favorite. And for some people who are real aficionados, a wide angle, that may be where a wide angle fast zoom, even though it's expensive, makes a lot of sense. I think Nikon makes a good, what is it, 14 to 24. There are some independent manufacturers that make similar things, but they're all f2.8, which is reasonably fast. Uh, I still think that the bang for your buck, the normal 50 millimeter lens is, is a good starting point because it's almost perfect focal length for those sort of constellation portraits where you just say, I want to take Orion and see what I can see. I want to take Andromeda and see what I can catch. And then a, a reasonably short to medium telephoto. You get longer than that, you start getting into some other issues. Here's the bad news. Almost everything, but especially the wide, you have to stop down significantly. So you may think you found a great deal on a used 24 millimeter lens that's f1.4 and it normally sells for 1400 and you can get it for six. You probably can't shoot it at f1.4 if you care about the stars in the corner. I don't care what manufacturer it is. I've shot with the very expensive ones and kind of haven't been satisfied with, with any of them, to be honest. Telephoto lenses are easier to, to, to design sharp, but a lot of times they're optimized not for infinity, but they're optimized for some other purpose. They may be portrait lenses. And so they're, they're shooting a human portrait from 30 feet, and maybe they don't care whether the corners are sharp in, the, in, in a portrait lens setting. In that realm, I, I'd absolutely argue you're better with a, a small refractor it's you know a triplet with a flattener element, and, and I'll give you an example. I've got I had I had the Red Cat and sold it because I didn't need that focal length. I have two others that are sort of these quad astrographs: a triplet objective and a, a flattener element. Four elements. My Nikon 500 millimeter telephoto that I use for wildlife. 19 elements. It's not a zoom. 19 elements. <laughs> If you care about contrast, 19 elements is probably not a good thing. Um, there's a lot of review sites out there. They typically don't test multiple copies of lenses. That's where I suspect happened with Rokinon. You know, maybe, maybe those, those internet reviewers were given a hand-selected copy from the manufacturer and they write a report saying it's the next best thing to slice bread. And if you're lucky enough to get one of those sharp copies, you would agree. But if you roll the dice and don't come up with one, and I rolled it sort of three times and had problems with all three copies, I, I copy variation, I think, comes with, with um, the budget. I mean, I do think if you spend more, you hopefully get better quality control and fewer dogs make it through out of the factory. 
The other thing is that most review sites don't test at all for coma or other aberrations in the corners. That's not something terrestrial photographers care about a whole lot. There's, I'll give you a reference to one site that does. That was the good and the bad. Here's the ugly part. We're used to, in telescope world, if you pay more money, you're getting not only more mechanical precision, the optical elements are more secure, they're easier to collimate, you have a better focuser, all those things, but you're getting better optical quality across the board. Flat field, higher resolution, min minimal vignetting, Camera lenses, more dollars seem to buy you better construction, but they may buy you better performance in only one or two areas because as, as you get expensive, lenses kind of get specialized. It's a portrait lens, it's a macro lens, it's a long telephoto for flying birds. And a lot of those applications, sharp corners aren't a priority for people. So my bottom line advice when you're when you're doing lens shopping, I mean, it's, it's a fun market in the used market. And the advantage there is if you buy used and it's a dog, you could probably sell it and recapture 90% of your investment. That's never the case if you were buying new and it's a dog. So read all the reviews, buy them, test them out, keep the ones that work and return or resell the losers. And I've, I've gone through enough cycles of that that I kind of think I'm done. I hope I'm done. <laughs> it's, you never know, but uh, here's, uh, I'll, I'll close with, with some resources. Um, the top five online sites, I think are all good. Parts of them are a little dated, but sometimes that advice, especially if you're starting at that level one, just a camera and lens and a tripod is still very good. Uh, some of the more recent ones like Nightscape Photographer, Lonely Spec are good about reviewing more recent lenses. Clark Vision is people, people like Doug or Greg would like, love Clark Vision. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, it gets very technical. I love that site. That's a good, that's a good reference. Okay. People, people know exactly how to take that then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fred, Fred Miranda buy and sell seems to be very reputable online for buying and selling used stuff. Lens Tip is the one site I know of that does test lenses for uh, coma and other aberrations. My all-time favorite program dealing with this, there's a guy in Canada who started out writing Backyard EOS for sort of laptop control of, of Canon cameras for astrophotography, and he's come out with a Nikon version as well. And to me, it's worth the headache of traveling with a laptop just because of the added control and features that that gives you. And PhotoPills is a little app for your, your phone or your tablet. One of the features it has, if you think about how long you can take a, a, an expo a single exposure of the stars without the trailing showing, obviously that depends on what declination you're shooting at. You can shoot pretty long on Polaris before it starts to trail, but something on, on, on the equator um, at zero deck, you know, is going to be your shortest one. Well, in photo pills, you can enter the frame size, the sensor size, and sort of the limits of where your target is. And it will give you a very precise number. And you have two choices. You can opt for the super sharp round stars, or you can opt for sort of the acceptable trailing, but a little trailing is okay. So it, it's, a, it's a handy feature. And with that, I'll wrap it up because I've sort of taken an hour. Any, any, anything I can answer? Wow, you've covered everything, so there's no questions. I guess so. <laughs> uh, any, I would, favorite, any favorite ex ex mistakes I made that you want to sort of rub my nose in? And drinking from a fire hydrant. <laughs> I and it's again, I, I if you have the gear at home, it it, it it just takes some time to start experimenting with it. Um. If you do a lot of travel, I mean, we already have access to good dark skies within two hours of Tucson. But if you're if you're traveling overseas, if you're if you're traveling to photograph Aurora, having sort of a basic system and knowing how it works before you leave home is 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 nice to have. 
the next obvious increment is going to a tracker. Well, in my case, I sort of figured out the tracker is nice when I'm going to dark sky with a car and I can take the studio tripod and I can take the laptop and I can take all the, the bits and pieces. When I went to the canyon, I just took the Olympus and a, the, a very lightweight tripod, we'll say. <laughs> okay. Uh, but then when I get serious and you want to duplicate the kind of things that you see people like Greg or Alex or, or, or Doug produce, your money might be better off in a real scope and a real cool camera and a real EQ mount. There, there's only so far you can push the DSLR or mirrorless cameras and then you're trying to make it into something that's not. Uh, Kevin, I have a question. One, sure. one thing that you didn't touch on was mirror lockup. And yes. is, that, is that a big issue with the newer cameras? I have an older camera and I usually use the two second timer to make the mirror lock up before the shutter opens. And that seems to work really well, but um, am I missing something there or is that? Well, I, I thought you were raising this just to taunt me because that's one of the other mistakes. If I were doing a sequence of exposures with my DSLR, I put it in mirror up mode. If I'm doing single exposure, I use the self timer. I can't tell you how many times I've confused the two and I, I fire up backyard Nikon, I program in a series of 40 exposures thinking it's on, on mirror up, but it's still on self timer. So when you hit start, the red light starts flashing and the timer starts beeping. Because, I mean, the whole point of mirrorless is you don't have that flipping mirror anymore. So you, you eliminate a big source of that vibration. But what you haven't eliminated is if you're still pressing the shutter button, you physically are vibrating the camera a little bit. Now you can continue to use the self timer on a mirrorless and in a sense, you don't have to worry about mirror up anymore. When I'm, when I'm doing tracked ones, obviously, I, whether it's with the Olympus, which is mirrorless, or whether it's with the Nikon, which is an SLR, I'm in kind of mirror up mode, if you will. But yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, manufacturers want to get rid of the mirror because it's added complexity in manufacturing. It's nice to get rid of it because for us, it was an added source of vibration. Well, and, uh, and Greg was alluding to this, but another function that I know the Nikons have, I'm not sure about the Canons, is a uh, delayed mirror. What it does is it flips the mirror up, it pauses for a second, and then it gets the trips the shutter. Right. So if you do sequences, that can be helpful. Again, right. to reduce shake afterwards. But, but, but basically, when I'm doing sequences now, I am either have a cable connection to the laptop, and I'm trying not to get near the cable or touch anything that connects to the camera, or I'm doing a wireless uh, intervalometer. So you know, it plugs into the hot shoe, connects to a port on the side of the camera body, and then I've got a little handheld thing that sort of controls the, the the sequence and the interval between each exposure and how many exposures and all that. I just don't like, even when you try to stiffen up the tripod and do everything you can, once it's set, I really don't want to touch it or get near it, if I can. Anything else for anybody that I can? I've got a general comment for Ken. I think he's done a wonderful presentation with a lot of background information. And uh, this is a great start for beginners. Thank you. Yep, very good. All right, well, we're a little over an hour. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I'm gonna uh, probably have us uh, wrap up. Anybody have uh, questions or comments? Okay, hearing none then, uh, I'll stop the recording and um, Hope to see you all again on the third Monday of uh, February. Good luck.